Hi, welcome back to the last lecture on Module 7. And in this lecture, we'll talk briefly about acid-base pH balance in the kidney. So, a um, couple of notes here on this picture. First of all, um, note where this process is occurring in the nephron. So this little figure up here showing sort of the initial portion, the initial segment of the collecting duct. So that's where these cells are. That's where this story is taking place. Okay, so there are a couple of different cell types in the collecting duct. These are type A cells. After this, we'll look at type B cells. They basically do the opposite. But type A cells are relatively active during acidosis. So you can think of the A for acidosis. And the, the big picture is that with acidosis, we want to get rid of the hydrogen. So hydrogen is being excreted into the lumen, while bicarbonate and potassium are being reabsorbed. We'll go work through the figure in just a moment. So as a result of acidosis, a patient with acidosis, um, that may be associated with hyperkalemia because they're retaining the potassium along with the bicarbonate. So you want to watch for that. You want to try to remember that. Oh, if I've got a patient and they have acidosis, check their potassium level. Don't um, forget. That would be something you wouldn't want to miss. And that will get drilled into you with um, uh, nursing programs. But if you hear it um, early on, maybe you'll remember it uh, later and not, not miss something like that. Okay, so let's just work our way through the drawing um, and not spend too much time on it, but just to kind of make sense out of it. Um, you know, you have blood again, get yourself oriented. Here is the lumen of the collecting duct. So this is the filtrate. And remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of acid. We're trying to get rid of the excess hydrogen ions. So let's just start over at the top right portion of the figure and here is our acid or high hydrogens so let's start here acidosis low pH so just follow through there's nothing new in this figure that we haven't seen before so hydrogen combines with bicarbonate ion. Now this um, reaction is abbreviated just for the sake of um, you know, not making this figure too busy. But you should recognize this and what's going on. Hydrogen plus bicarbonate would make carbonic acid and then that would be split into the CO2 and the water. So much of that isn't shown, but you should recognize that if you make carbonic acid, we're going to be making CO2. Okay, so then the CO2 enters the cell. And the CO2 then combines with water inside the cell. Here some more of the details are um, included. There's the carbonic anhydrase. Makes the carbonic acid, which isn't shown. It's just showing the acid after it's ionized back to the hydrogen and the bicarbonate. So remember what we're trying to do? We're trying to get rid of the hydrogen and reabsorb the bicarbonate. So we just follow the bicarbonate for a moment. We just made some bicarbonate by combining it with CO2 and water. And that bicarbonate produced inside the cell and it leaves the cell. 
and then it also acts as a buffer and goes back into the blood. Does this part look familiar? What does that look like? Where have we seen that before? Yeah, that's the chloride shift, and we saw that on red blood cells at the tissues when the CO2 was entering and we were making bicarbonate and it left the red blood cell is replaced by the chloride. So that looks familiar. Okay, so we've reabsorbed and produced some more bicarbonate. Let's get rid of the hydrogen. So back to the hydrogen that was produced. It, some of it, it's, it gets pumped out and it's pumped out here. And it also gets pumped out here. But check out what's going on here with this primary active antiporter. We're pumping, what, before we get lost, we're pumping out the hydrogen. Should have used different colors. And at the same time, we're bringing in potassium. So now we're moving potassium out of the cell, and more of that gets reabsorbed. So you might clean that figure up and work your walk yourself through it again. But with acidosis, we're getting rid of the hydrogen and we're retaining the bicarbonate and potassium. So you might remember that the hydrogen and the potassium move in opposite directions. Hydrogen is going out of the cell into the filtrate, potassium is going back into the blood from the filtrate. So there's a connection between the acidosis and the hyperkalemia. Okay, the next slide is similar. You just take the blue cells and you basically flip-flop them or you move all the transporters that are on the apical membrane to the basal lateral, you just switch them. So let's take a look at that. So, um, this is a type B cell. And this is the picture with alkalosis. The previous picture was with acidosis. And let's work through the box on the left. It's pretty similar to the box we had on the previous slide. Again, we're in the same place on the collecting duct, the initial segment. And these are type B cells, and you might think B for base. basic pH, it's alkaline, we have alkalosis, and now it's just the opposite. So with alkalosis, we want to lower the pH, it's too high, so we're going to be retaining hydrogen and excreting bicarbonate. So again, it's the same connection Bicarbonate moves with potassium, and those move in opposite directions to the hydrogen. So, with alkalosis, you should be thinking, well, I wonder if the patient is going to be hypokalemic. So let's just walk through this diagram in a similar way. So we have low hydrogen. 
So start with, start here, I suppose. Carbon dioxide and water. Make the bicarbonate ion, same thing that we saw before. And now the bicarbonate is leaving on this side. It's not leaving on the other side. We just move the machinery from the right side of the cell over to the left side of the cell. Excreting the bicarbonate ion and exchanging that for a chloride ion. Okay, so there's our chloride shift again. So that gets us reabsor or excreting the bicarbonate. And then the hydrogen that is produced gets pumped out of the cell, this time on the right side of the membrane, but the same machinery, the same pumps, we just moved them from the left over to the right, pumping out hydrogen and then we have the hydrogen and potassium exchanger, just exactly as before. So as we pump the hydrogen into the interstitial fluid, we're removing the potassium. So they're going in opposite directions. So the potassium then leaves. And that may lead to hypokalemia. Okay, so make up a cell, try to um, get the basic movement of the ions. With alkalosis, what do you want to do? You want to get rid of the buffer and retain hydrogens. You need to raise, the, you need to lower the pH. You need to raise the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, so we're just about done. The next slide, sort of a uh, larger concept, um, looking at acidosis and common um, causes of it. Remember that acidosis is more common than alkalosis. You'll see acidosis many more times um, than you will see alkalosis. Either of these can be a respiratory or metabolic origin, because we know that the lungs affect the pH. We've talked about hypo and hyperventilation. So if you have, you have alkalosis or acidosis due to lung involvement, it's referred to as respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. Conversely, you may have metabolic, where the kidneys aren't working properly. So, all this picture is showing is sort of the balance of hydrogen. This is sort of a normal picture here. There's nothing bizarre going on. So, it's just saying that what are the sources of hydrogen? What are the inputs? And then you also have the outputs. And you're trying to maintain balance in the body. Well, some of the sources for acids are amino acids, fatty acids. You can all, and it comes from your diet. And you can also have carbon dioxide, lactic acid, keto acids from metabolism. That's adding to the hydrogen balance. And there's our normal blood plasma pH range. 7.4 in the middle. So the average equals 7.4. And then the buffers, we've talked about this before. Um, bicarbonate in the extracellular fluid, so it's outside the cells both in the, um, primarily in the plasma. And then there are proteins that act as buffers. We talked about that. We saw how amino acids on hemoglobin 
can act as buffers and then there's also phosphate as well. Didn't talk about those. How do you get rid of the hydrogens? Well, through ventilation, we blow off CO2. And remember, the hydrogens are basically in the water that don't count anymore. And then renal, and this would be excretion. So we can get rid of hydrogens either through the kidneys and the urine or through ventilation. And again, we talked about how respiratory patterns can affect pH. Okay, last slide. And again, it may be a little bit small, and you may just want to enlarge it on your computer, but it's showing sort of a reflex pathway. So, it's an idea here where we have respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis. So, have acidosis and how do the lungs compensate for it is basically what we're doing. The title, don't let it intimidate you. So, start with a stress. So, we have acidosis. So, and we're going to fix that through the respiratory system. And here are our muscles of ventilation, our muscles of respiration. So that's what we're going to use to fix the acidosis. So we have hot, so two things. We have CO2 levels in the plasma, and we also have hydrogen levels in the plasma. Remember that the CO2 in the plasma stimulates the central chemoreceptors. It's able to diffuse into the cerebral spinal fluid. and it binds those chemoreceptors. And remember what happens in the CO2, or to the CO2 in the CSF? It combines with water, right? And that formed carbonic acid. And then that dissociated into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. And it's that little tiny hydrogen that I drew that binds to the central chemoreceptors. And then that stimulated the respiratory control centers in the medulla Okay, let's go over and remember this accounted for approximately 70% of the drive. Well, the other 30% are still there. So that's over on the other side. And we have increased plasma hydrogen ion concentration. So these are the hydrogens that are in the blood. They couldn't cross the blood-brain barrier to the central chemoreceptors, but they're in the blood and they can bind to the chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies directly. And then that also stimulates the respiratory control centers. More action potentials to the neurons. We increase our rate and depth of breathing. We blow off the CO2. And as we blow that off, we raise the pH. Less acid, so. And then the blue lines are just showing negative feedback. As the pH in the blood goes up, as we decrease the CO2 levels, 
that feeds back on the central chemoreceptors and we stimulate, we stimulate the respiratory muscles less and the thing shuts down. So, um, some of these figures are sort of concept maps that may be a little bit different, but I think it all works. So, spend some time with it and practice. Get some blank pieces of paper, look at the picture, and then put it aside and see if you can draw something similar. Don't try to just copy the thing exactly as drawn. There's not much there's not as much learning in that as if you set a blank piece of paper in front of you and try to create it without just copying it. You don't want to lay the paper right over the figure and trace it. That's not going to help your brain sort of process the information as well as if you struggle with it a little bit. Maybe put down some notes on your paper before you start, things that you want to talk about. Central chemoreceptors, for example, respiratory muscles, maybe the respiratory control center in the medulla. And then you've got that in a list, and then you can take your piece of paper, rearrange those items, and hook up some arrows and um, talk your way through it. So, I look forward to questions when you have them. We'll uh, talk with you soon.